marvelous. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Damien Lacey. I'm the Chief Executive of Federal Children Australia. Welcome to this uh, workshop this morning. Um, Professor Barry Wright is the clinical lead of the National Deaf Children, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service from England. Um, and it's the only, as I think he will describe it, it's the only, at least in the English speaking world, the only national dedicated mental health service for deaf children. Um, I've just spent uh, the last week with Barry and I've got to know him and his connection to the deaf community. And I'm sure at his presentation you'll talk about the struggles I've had in identifying the um, the need uh, in getting the uh, bureaucratic system to address it and make a commitment towards it. And that's part of his presentation. You'll talk about that because that's as, a, as important to us as of how it happened as opposed as also what they do and how they do it. Um, it took some time for Barry and his team and others in partnership to actually get the commitment or get the, the concentration of both data and also then the opportunity to do something, but they've done it. Um, and I'll leave Barry to talk about that. Very importantly, Barry is also not only just interested in services, but how mental health, specialist mental health services fits within the context of child adolescent mental health services in the United Kingdom. So how the mainstream service providers operate. But also, who are the people who need to deliver the service? So career path development, for example, is very important. Who are the professionals? Who are the group of people that need to be here in this, in this space? And in that, I've done a lot to encourage deaf people to get involved, be involved, and develop qualifications. And also mental health uh, specialists to become qualified and knowledgeable in the deaf space. So I think without further ado, um, I will invite Barry to come to the podium and speak to us. I'm going to talk about um, children who are deaf <coughs> and emotional and mental health difficulties that they might have and why. And, and why the rates of mental health difficulties are higher in deaf children than in hearing children. We'll discuss that a bit. And then we're going to talk a bit about the fact that in England we didn't have a service, deaf children weren't accessing services to help them with those difficulties, and then how we set one up. And we'll talk a little bit about that service. So, uh, we're not perfect, we are, we're still learning all the time, and it's fantastic actually to come over here and hear all the good things that are happening in Australia and different places, and I'll be taking some of those, uh, some of that knowledge and, uh, back with me to. So I'll crack on, uh, I'm going to talk, if, obviously if the communication isn't right, stop, because it's important to get that right. And I'll say now, actually, one of the first things we do with any child we ever see is a deaf and a hearing member of our team go out and meet the family first before any kind of assessment happens to talk to them about what their communication needs are. That's the first thing that happens. And we also talk to them about what it is they think they, they want, what they want from the service, what they think they need, and we get different perspectives of different people. So what does the child want? What does the parent want? And the referrer usually gives their opinion about what they want. And it's fascinating that they're always usually very, very different. Mm -hmm. the, the child wants to make friends. The teacher wants you know, the children to be paying attention in class or something. The parent will often want something different. So <clears throat> then you have to meld all those hopes and goals and aspirations together in, in the clinical service that you're providing. But the first thing we do is we try and make sure that the communication so I'm going to talk about the higher rates of mental health problems uh, first, and uh, they are about two to three times higher, and that's really across quite a lot of different countries now, um, mainly European countries, uh, but the, quite a lot of studies have shown higher rates of mental health problems in children. And of course it's quite difficult because a lot of the things, the instruments, the tools, the questionnaires that they use for uh, working it out have been developed for hearing children. Um, so it is a bit of a crude, they are, a lot of these studies are quite crude in that sense, that the, the instruments aren't designed, questionnaires aren't designed for deaf children or deaf parents. And one of the research studies we're doing in England at the moment is to translate one of those mental health screening instruments into British Sign Language and we're just, we're just testing it now amongst uh, 600 people in the country. 
Um, but if you use uh, those kind of instruments that are looking for mild mental health problems, they find about 50% about of kids have some kind of emotional or behavioral difficulty. I'm talking about mild ones. If you're looking at the severe end, kids who really do need to access mental health services definitely need to access mental health services because they have obsessive compulsive disorder or uh, are experiencing very distressing psychological symptoms. That's more like 4%. Uh, and that, that does seem to be the case across, across the world, although I suspect it's much higher in some places than others. The difficulty, of course, though, is you can't say just because you're a deaf child, you've got three times the rate of a mental health problem, because all deaf children are different. Um, uh, we were talking just before we started about the fact that just the different causes of deafness can give you additional difficulties, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So why is it that deaf children have higher rates of mental health problems? Well, in some families, uh, and there's, again, research for this, uh, it's very important that parent-child communication can create difficulties for you. So if parent-child communication in infancy is poor, then that leads to difficulties for you because communication is a, a crucial part of um, how we develop emotionally and how we learn, <coughs> and how we learn how to socialize, how we learn how to play, and all sorts of difficulties result if you can't communicate your needs, communicate your emotions, and so on. And there are more mental health problems if there is poor part child health communication or poor language development, which of course is, uh, if you have poor communication in early life, you're going to have poor language development. And this particular study showed that nearly 60% of, uh, of families where there was clear evidence of poor child communication had mental health problems, the children did. Um, family coping and adjustment is an interesting one because there is research showing that there are, if there are high levels of parental stress, there are more problems, and if there are, if there's very positive family support and good networking, there are less mental health problems. Of course, the direction of the effect isn't necessarily known. It may well be that the high levels of stress are caused partly by the mental health problems, but it is an important finding, uh, particularly the finding that good networks and good family support is important. Um, there are more mental health problems if a child has additional neurological problems. So a couple of weeks ago I saw a child with epilepsy is having a fit every seven to nine days, big tonic-clonic fit, so he's shaking and he's uh, affected for 24 hours after a fit. And when we've just recently finished doing diaries with the family and the young man uh, because he has a lot of OCD obsessive compulsive type behaviours where he has to repeatedly do things and he also gets very aggressive and we found that the obsessive compulsive behaviours are getting increased before and after a fit and the aggression is happening in the two days before he has a fit and that's really important information because it helps us to understand what kind of support we might need to give him in that period of time but also the importance of and getting more control over his fits. Uh, in terms of etiology of deafness, I think this, this, this is where this uh, is important because a lot of children may have additional neurological problems but they may also have additional physical problems. So for example, if we look at, in, and, and the etiology or the causes of deafness are different in every country. So if you go to Africa, you might have um, kids with mumps, uh, and jaundice causing a lot more deafness than you would get, say, in Australia. Uh, if you go to America, you get neurosurgery appears on the list of causes of deafness, which doesn't really appear if you go somewhere like Africa. Uh, so the causes of deafness are different from country to country and depend on health policies and, and how much money they've got to spend on prevention and that kind of thing. But in England, about, 30, about a third of causes of deafness have some genetic cause. And there are different types of genetic causes, and they're very different. So of that 30%, 10% are, um, are chromosomal or syndromal. And by that I mean that uh, there is more than one gene affected, and therefore there is usually more than... There are, there are, other, there are things that affect the child's development 
So for example, charge syndrome would be an example where you have a heart, you might have some heart defects, you might have some kidney problems, you might have some visual problems, etc. And all those things uh, create more difficulties for you in life as you're growing up. And uh, as a result, you may have more challenges to face, both developmentally, but also in how you negotiate the external world. And those things may lead you to have more mental health difficulties. On the other hand, the other 20% of genetic causes on what we would call non-syndromal deafness, where there may be one single gene, and it's just affecting one small membrane in the cochlea, and those people are entirely healthy, perfectly average, uh, in, in the sense that uh, they're, they're, you know, they're bright uh, people. The only thing that's affected is the cochlea. So uh, you would expect those people, if the conditions are right in their environment and their family life, to go on and have a healthy, happy life, quite different from the ones with big chromosomal abnormalities. So that's the first third. The second third are usually acquired, so they'd be things like perinatal trauma, so not getting enough oxygen during birth, having an infection during pregnancy, having meningitis after birth, um, Sometimes in special care baby units, kids are given very toxic drugs to keep them alive, like antibiotics, like gentamicin that might damage the ear. So sometimes it's ototoxicity, it's, it's, a, it's a drug that's attacking the ear, and so on. So that, that, that group will obviously have a, uh, other potentially adi additional difficulties. So for example, if you have meningitis, it doesn't just affect, affect the apparatus, hearing it affects all sorts of other bits of your brain and that's going to affect you maybe in terms of your IQ, it might affect you in terms of uh, your hand-to-eye coordination, uh, your learning abilities and other things. And those in turn are, are more likely to have mental health problems. We know that young people with intellectual difficulties have higher rates of 